And it's your first time at the Diabetic Clinic? It is, yes. Okay, my name's Jane, I'm a diabetes nurse, and my job is just to teach you how to blood test and how to give an insulin injection. Okay. If you're diagnosed with uh, type 2 diabetes, then on average you're in your 60s, and typically what would happen is that the GP and the practice nurse would talk to you about diet and lifestyle and target weights, and then uh, would give you um, uh, some advice about type 2 diabetes, but they wouldn't necessarily start treatment straight away. And commonly they'd ask you to come back a few weeks later just to see how you're doing and repeat your average blood glucose measurement called the HbA1c. And then they would talk to you about what sort of glucose target you should be aiming for. And there are lots of different medication that people go on, so the most important medication which has got the most evidence behind it for its use is, a, is a something called metformin. In people with type 2 diabetes, one of the fundamental defects is that in people who don't have diabetes, what happens is that when you eat, the excess energy that you're eating is taken up by the liver and your liver stores that excess energy um, and you don't then release any extra glucose into the blood because you've just taken it after, you, after you've eaten. And then when you fast, then the liver very slowly breaks down that stored energy to maintain your, the level of glucose in the blood. So there's a switch that tells you when to turn off and on to produce glucose from the liver. But in people with type 2 diabetes, that switch is permanently turned in the wrong direction. So you, you keep producing glucose even in what's called the fed state. Once you've had a meal, when you don't normally want the liver to produce more glucose, the liver keeps pumping it out. But metformin turns that switch back to normal. So that's, what, that's the main way that it works. The next most commonly used class of drug are what's called the sulfonylureas. Now these are actually glucose lowering drug, glycoside or glipizide or glibenclamide for example, big release of insulin into the circulation and because you've got more insulin on board you actually start then lowering your blood sugars. The next class of drug is this thing called acarbose. The way that it works is by stopping you absorbing glucose from your gut so it slows down the absorption, the side effects of that which is the diarrhea, the wind, the bloating which can make people feel quite unwell so we don't use it very often. The next class of drug are called the thiazolidine diones. It's a long word, there's only one of them in the UK and it's called pioglitazone. If you think about a cell and how insulin interacts with that cell, you have to have a receptor on the cell surface and the insulin works on, latches onto that receptor and then it has its effects in the cell. It promotes the production of more of these receptors so that for any given amount of insulin, you actually lower the blood sugars. So it works in a brilliant way, but the problem is it takes a very long time to work and take up several weeks or months to, before it reaches its maximum effect. Yes, we do use it, but only in very, very certain, very specific people who we think it would be beneficial for. Nataglinide and repaglinide. The metaglinides are very short-acting drugs. They go in, squeeze and let go. So you get a very transiently raised insulin level. DPP4s and the examples there are saxagliptin, linagliptin, um, cetagliptin. Uh, vildagliptin and uh, alagliptin. This normal, this natural hormone which is produced in the blood hangs around only for about two minutes. The good thing about these drugs is that they're tablets rather than injections. The bad thing about the drugs is that they actually, because unlike the injections when you're giving very large doses, here all you're doing is restoring the levels back to what they should be, so you don't necessarily get weight loss. You do still get an improvement in overall diabetes control, which is excellent. Now the final class of drugs uh, are fairly new, they're called the SGLT2 inhibitors. Now, so this drug stops you losing glucose, oh, sorry, promotes glucose loss in the urine. So you're losing calories, which is why you lose weight. You're getting rid of some extra fluid, which is why you lose a bit of weight. They're good in some respects because they do improve diabetes. It's got nothing to do with insulin, but it's bad because potentially you're having to pee a bit more. A common uh, point in somebody's diabetes life is they end up on top doses of metformin and top doses of glycoside and then the question is what should one do after that, what's the best treatment and that there are uh, several different options. Um, one is to think about insulin treatment in addition to tablets and most people would be reluctant to think about insulin because it tends to promote weight gain so would often choose a third tablet or they would try a different injectable treatment called a GLP-1 agonist. 
uh, which are increasingly used. And the advantage of these GLP-1 agonists is that it, they don't tend to promote weight gain, they tend to promote weight loss. So what happens is that people's diabetes improves, it slows your guts down so you absorb the glucose far more slowly, uh, it, it switches off the liver, uh, and it stops it liberating too much glucose, it squeezes those uh, beta cells of the soggy sponges full of insulin to liberate more insulin, so it brings your blood sugars down. But it also fools your brain into thinking that you're full, so you physically eat less. So that's brilliant. When, when you started, you had some insulin being produced, but not enough. So through no fault of your own, um, you're now needing insulin by injections. Um, and I'll teach you that. And it's nowhere near as, as bad as you think. OK. OK. So the first thing I want to do today is actually show you the insulin injection. Because I think if you're, if you're worried about doing an injection, you're not going to concentrate on the, on the blood testing. Okay. So there's various different pens about. Um, there are some that already have the insulin in them. Mm -hmm. And there's actually 300 units of insulin in there. And you're only going to be on eight twice a day okay. just to start with. Um, so the, the amounts you have are tiny. Okay. So some come with the insulin already in them. And some, some come where you need to put a cartridge in. Which do you think is easier to start with? Uh, Prefill's probably I'll easier to start with. Okay. Then. So if I give you the insulin, if I give you the pen, mm -hmm. and then you can just pop the needle on the end, and I'll do the same with my pen, okay. and then we can just do it as we go along. Okay, the needles are very tiny. Mm -hmm. So all you need to do, if you just take the lid off your, your pen, yeah. okay, Thank and then you. you just tear the paper tab, just pull that straight off. Okay, and then you just push that and screw it as far as it will go, so you can't get it on any further. Yeah. Okay, and that's your big cap. So just pop okay. that on the side because you'll need that later. Yeah. And then that's your little cap that covers, covers your needle. Okay. Now you're going to be on a, a mixed insulin. Your insulin will be a mixture of clear insulin and cloudy insulin. So it's really important every time before you use it that you give it a really good mix. Okay. So I, I call it giving it a squeeze. So just up and down about 10 times to make sure that it's all, all mixed. Okay, then before you do your injection, you just need to make sure there's no air in there. Mm -hmm. Okay, and also that the needle's got a hole in it because the needles are so tiny now. So just take the cap off the end there. So just be careful because the needle underneath. Okay, and then you would just dial up to two on the end of your pen. Can mm -hmm. you see the yeah. window there? Okay, and you literally just squirt that out. So just press the button. Yep, just press that and then you should get something oh, coming yeah, out. So, yeah. you, so you can see that, it, that it's clear. Yeah. And then you need to dial up your dose. So your dose is going to be eight. So if you just dial up eight, yeah. okay, I'll get you to do it in the penguin because okay. he, he won't mind. Lovely. <laughs> okay. So all you would do, when you do an injection, you can put it in the top of your arms. Some of there's a little bit of flesh, but I wouldn't use your arms too much because it's quite a small area. Yeah. You can do it in your tummy or your legs, somewhere where there's a little bit of fat to pop it in. Okay. When I was first diagnosed, it, I wasn't really told or encouraged to then, 32 years ago. Um, and so consequently, I have got two kind of not very nice lumps on my stomach because I always injected in the same area. But now I do vary the injection sites um, to stop that happening. And also, if you do that, then the absorption is better, so you're making your insulin more efficient. It works more efficiently if you're putting the needle into different places. Is it okay to do it through clothing, or should no, you def avoid No, definitely that? not through clothing. Okay. I mean, if you've got a pair of tights on, that's probably fine if they're sort of fairly holy tights, because yeah. you can just put it through. But no, because you can pick up fibres. Okay. Plus, the needles are really tiny. Can you see how tiny mm -hmm. that is? If you went through a pair of jeans, you'd hardly get get your injection yeah. so that's definitely no. Okay. So just for the purpose of demonstrating I'm just going to pop it in my arm so all you would do best way to hold the pen so if you imagine you're doing the same yeah that's okay so if you grab it then the pressure is in your thumb mm -hmm. okay so you just put the needle in as far as it will go yeah okay you press down on the end okay now you've pressed down you just count to 10 and take it out so to get rid of the needle don't put the little cap back on because it can go go through the side. If you just pop the big cap yeah. back on, okay, then twist and it will pull the needle off. Perfect. Okay. 
and then just pop that in a sharp spin that the GP will give you. Oh, lovely. We'll give you two as a starter, mm -hmm. but when you get them from the doctor, you'll get a box of five pens. You keep your spare insulin in the fridge, mm -hmm. uh, but the one you're using is fine at room temperature. Okay. Uh, it keeps for 28 days out of the fridge. Okay. And what should I do if I were to forget to take my insulin? You could do it just after. Um, if if you haven't taken your morning injection and you've got to lunchtime, I generally suggest that you just take half a dose. Okay. Otherwise, you're going to overlap when you get, get to tea time. Yeah. Okay. Most people, pretty much all people over the age of 40 with diabetes should be taking a statin. And uh, the uh, statin treatment is determined not by your cholesterol. A lot of people think that they have to have a cholesterol of above six or seven or eight before they need statin treatment, but that's not the case. Um, it's simply having diabetes and being over 40 means you should be on a statin because the evidence is quite strong that people benefit in terms of their cardiovascular risk reduction. Well, at cardiovascular disease, it's a, a long term for things that we know a lot about already, which is angina, heart attacks, strokes and circulatory problems in the legs. So um, the reason why that's important uh, in uh, the diabetes world is that people with diabetes have a much higher risk of getting uh, cardiovascular disease and circulatory problems. Most GPs would use either simvastatin or atorvastatin. I think that's probably one of the most important interventions that any, uh, anybody can have really in terms of their cardiovascular risk reduction with diabetes. Uh, many people with type 2 diabetes end up needing uh, one, two or three blood pressure tablets. So one of the uh, difficulties with type 2 diabetes is you can end up taking lots of diabetes tablets, you can take statins, you need to take blood pressure tablets. Um, but commonly the practices would start people on blood pressure treatment relatively early in their course of their condition because they know that the benefits are really very dramatic. And most practices will um, talk to people about their blood pressure very early on in their sort of diabetes life.